You're listening to the Autism Weekly Podcast. Each week, we share community voices and bring light to stories that increased awareness, acceptance, equity, access, and inclusion. If you haven't already, subscribe to join the Autism Weekly family. I'm your host, Jeff Skibitsky. This week, we welcome Dr. Matthew Wapit to the podcast to talk with us about strategies for inclusion and how to be an anti-ableist. Dr. Wapit is a researcher, a writer, and an educator in leadership, stress management, and inclusion. His expertise in disability studies informs his approach to compassionate leadership, which has been taught in a variety of organizations and classrooms, but is also completely relevant in our everyday lives. Dr. Wapit's research also looks at the impact of laughter as a stress reduction technique and a tool to create social inclusion. We have much to learn from you, Dr. Wapit. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Jeff. I'm glad to be here. So you have quite the background thing from academia to uh, whitewater rafting. Um, but I'm really curious is how you came about to being referred to as the laughter doctor. Um, <laughs> how did you get to that point and, and educating others on the benefit of this? <laughs> well, it was completely unintentional. Um So I think one thing to know about me is that uh, I have probably undiagnosed an adult attention deficit disorder. My ability to focus on one thing longer than 30 minutes is significantly uh, lower than most people's. (laughs) And so I like a lot of variety in my life. And um, and so, yeah, just kind of as things come up, as I become interested in them, I'm I'm just innately curious and go into it. Um, The laughter stuff came up. Boy, in 2009, when I was living in Moscow, Idaho, there, um, I was really stressed out. I had I was involved with some community drama, <laughs> as it were, and it was having an impact on my life. So like any good academic, I decided to go back to school. And I took that summer in 2009, actually went to uh, Harvard Medical School to do some uh, clinical research, clinical work, postdoctoral work on mind-body medicine. And really, I was going for myself to better understand the mind-body connection and some of the science and stress management. And it was kind of like professional development for myself. But while I was there, I was exposed to, they have a laughter lab where they study the effects of laughter, and I became exposed to laughter yoga. Um, and really found it to be fun, engaging, um, but yeah, I went back to Idaho after that summer, and actually a few students found out that I'd studied this and wanted to start a laughter club at the University of Idaho, and they said, would you be the faculty mentor? And I'm like, well, I've really never done this, but sure, I'll figure it out. And it kind of just went from there. The club started off with like three of us sitting around in a room laughing to becoming like 50 or 60 people in a group just laughing for 30 or 40 minutes. Um and it kind of became a thing. <laughs> and now now I travel all over the country teaching people how to laugh, although that's not <laughs> it, it, it's just something that I do, I guess. I think, it's good for me. It's good for everybody else. So, you know, I don't complain. And, you know, I, 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 when when you're sitting there talking about it and just realizing that there is so much to be able to kind of sit back. And I think it's a good tie in to kind of the idea of ableism and mm-hmm. Being an anti-ableist is that the flexibility of thought for somebody to really appreciate the world around them, which laughter is doing that, I think. Yep. Um, how does that, I, I guess I'll start with what is anti-ableism, but how do those things tie together? That's a complicated, well, let's address the first part of that question first. What is, what is anti-ableism and what does that mean? Um, I think you hear the term, you, you assume that you're ableist or you're not ableist, just like people assume you're racist or you're not racist. And I think this idea of being an anti-racist or an anti-ableist actually came up by uh, Ibram X. Kendi. He's a professor of anti-racist research and policy at American University. He's written a few books that have kind of controversial, (laughs) but he's really, I thought, encapsulated this concept of anti-racism or if we apply it in in disability, anti-ableism really quite well. And really he says, if racism means both racist action and inaction, in the face of racism, then anti-racism means active participation in combating 
racism in all forms. And we can take out the racism and put ableism in there, right? If ableism means both able, ableist action and ableist inaction in the face of ableism, then anti-ableism means active participation in that. And really, when you that's very academic speak. When you break that down, it really means that to be an anti-ableist, you're taking active steps to counter and address the ableist norms within our society. Um, it means you're not just neutral. It's not like, oh, I'm not ableist, or I, a lot of people like to think that neutrality is okay, I guess, <laughs> or that's how, oh, I'm not racist, I'm neutral. I don't take a position on this, or I'm not ableist, I'm neutral. I mean, and I think Desmond Tutu said it really well. Um, he said, if you're neutral in situations of injustice, you've chosen the side of the oppressor, right? If an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse, and you say that you are neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. I mean, so, mm, yeah. so I mean, to be anti-ableist means that we're not just saying we're not ableist. It means that we're taking active steps to actually do something about it. Does that make sense? When, I think it does. But I, I, what might help to put it into perspective is when when you think about ableism as it mm -hmm. pertains to disabilities, and, and let's use autism as as our as our focus here. What would be some examples of maybe ableist viewpoints or ways that uh, perspectives kind of enforce that sort of that view within society right now? Yeah, that's a it's actually interesting to to think about that and making it practical is, I think, difficult for some people because it does require thinking outside of the way that we typically look at especially disability within our society but um it just means you can't treat somebody with a disability the same as everybody else to truly address ableism it requires us to do something so i think inclusion is actually a great example of this a lot of times when we think about inclusion especially within schools a lot of times people assume, oh, I've put the student with a disability in the regular classroom. They're included. But just because they're there doesn't necessarily mean that they have the supports and they have the, the services and everything that they need to actually take advantage of that classroom setting right and i've done i've done inclusion research there in idaho and washington and utah and i've seen so many situations where we have kids with disabilities sitting in the classroom and you know you talk to the teachers and like oh yeah they're included but they're sitting in the back of the classroom not involved not engaged maybe even working on completely different work than the rest of the class but they're there and so we're saying oh they're included um, you know, to really address that issue, we have to look at it in a more proactive way. We have to say, okay, it means we have to actually do something to make sure that this student with a disability actually fits in and belongs and is having the same opportunities as everybody else. Just putting someone in a situation isn't going to mean they have the same opportunities or the same involvement or the same sense of belonging. And so it means being proactive. It means mm -hmm. saying, yeah, it means maybe doing something a little bit extra, right? To ensure yeah. that that person who is different, whether it's race, disability, whatever the case may be, has an equal opportunity to participate in the environment. And again, I sorry, I tend to get a little academic on these things. But... No, you know what what you're illustrating there. It's uh, it's ironic that that you chose the school setting for that is my my daughter had come home uh, probably about three or four weeks ago. And, and it really kind of, it hit home to me as a clinician in this field. But her frustration was, we're not helping the people in my classroom. They're yep. sitting in the back row. They have a headphones on. They're not participating. They don't feel included. Nobody engages with them. And she was on the verge of tears about this. And it, it gave me hope that, all right, well, my daughter's seeing it. And yep. hopefully is that we can start that voice process. But in a situation like that, it it almost feels like there was there was really no way to understand the strengths of an individual, to figure out yep. ways they could be contributors, uh, observer of the community. 
is is that kind of the the idea of being an anti ableist is similar to what my daughter might have been feeling, but acting on it and letting people know, listen, we need to do something. I need to figure out ways as a peer network to involve them, but my school needs to step up and do something. Yep. No, I that that is a great example because really what it defines is where that shift in how we think about inclusion and ableism needs to take place. Um, a lot of, we, we've always thought, of, especially within the disability field, inclusion has been something that we do to people with disabilities. But if we look at inclusion research in any way, whether it's disability, race, uh, gender, ethnicity, I mean, there's lots of inclusion research looking at different aspects of diversity, the way that you really include somebody and address those underlying attitudes is by the people who are insiders, who are in that situation, taking ownership and saying, we want everybody to feel like an insider. We don't want anybody to be here as an outsider. And so the shift doesn't mean putting the person with a disability in place. When you put a person with a disability in that in a setting, so let's say a regular classroom, you, essentially what you're saying is you're telling them, oh, we want you to fit in, right? And fitting in places the responsibility on the individual to adapt and change their behaviors to meet the needs of the norm. Um, and that places all the responsibility on that individual who already is different in one or more ways than the majority of the group. Inclusion, and the way I would refer to it as belonging, actually flips that on its head. It says fitting in is difficult. Fitting in is stressful. Fitting mm -hmm. in is really hard for anybody who's ever been an outsider and you're trying to fit in. It's not the way that we want to feel. So to really address the issue, it requires everybody in that setting, your daughter, the other students, the teachers, the administrators to say, this isn't okay. We want this person to be involved with this, working in our groups, you know, learning the same stuff we're learning, participating in the activities. Um, we don't want them to be over there doing their own thing because that just, in many ways, that just calls more attention to their mm -hmm. difference. Um, no, absolutely. So. I mean, I could, I could definitely see that. And I could see that taking place where, especially as, as children are developing and their peers are developing, is that the more that you cause that inherent difference to be highlighted, Right. Is that instead of being able to celebrate the difference as far as how does this person affect my life in a positive way? What are the things that they're contributing? What are the strengths that them make me better by being a part of the community, a part of the group? It almost becomes an outsider insider like you described, which is which is scary. Um, what are what are the barriers? I mean, one of the things I look at in my community is the fact that there aren't the re resources to be able to do it effectively all the time. It is it is harder to be able to really create kind of that sense of belonging versus mm -hmm. a sense of being there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, are, what, are the, what are the barriers that we run into? There's gotta be cultural bar barriers with our society. <laughs> There's gotta be a variety of things. What do you see? Yeah, I mean, well, belonging, is something that we're all, and and you're gonna notice I'm shifting my language from inclusion to belonging, because I think, especially with relation to disability, the way that we talk about inclusion has changed. And it, it means more a place now. People think of inclusion as a place, they're in that place. And so, you know, that term belonging, I think redefines what we actually want to see. And belonging, like you said, is about more than inclusion. It's about helping people, like I said, who feel like insiders instead of outsiders. And it really, you know, if we think about what that sounds like, it means that a person can walk into a setting and say, can a person like me belong and succeed here? And there's lots of factors, both in the physical environment and in the, the cultural environment that send those messages. So, it means that when you walk into a setting that you're going to see others who look like you. You're just going to see others who communicate like you. You're going to see others who want to spend time with you, right? Who greet you as a member of the group. Um, you see representations of people like you 
in the content, in the videos that are being shown or in the books that you're reading or in the posters that are on the wall, you see yourself. And because when we see ourselves, we're like, oh, I must fit here. Um, it means that you have role models in those settings who are like you, who have leadership roles or and who can provide mentorship and say, I've been through this and I did it. You can do it too. Um, and so all of those little cultural things, yeah, it requires a cultural shift. And again, the the burden of the responsibility can't be on the person who is different. The burden of the responsibility has to be on those who are in the culture and make that culture. And it does require changing behaviors. And again, I think I think that's where we've fallen short. We focus so much on changing the behaviors of people with disabilities, people with autism spectrum disorders, whatever it is, to fit the norm. Um, but the fact is, is that a lot of times these are behaviors or attributes that you can't change, right? A person who uses a wheelchair, they can't just decide I'm not going to use a wheelchair and I'm going to walk today. Right? That's not how mm -hmm. a person, I mean, a lot of these things that make somebody different are immutable. They're, they're not changeable. And so you can't expecting the person to change and adapt is not realistic. Although I think that's how we've thought about it. And again, I think we need to shift that and say, okay, it has to be the students. It has to be the teachers. It has to be the leaders. It has to be the employees, whatever setting it is who are changing the way that they think about who they want to have in their group. And so the yeah. intervention, again, can't be about treating the person who's different. The intervention has to be for the majority to change mm -hmm. those attitudes because attitudes lead to behaviors and behaviors lead to culture, right? Mm, no, absolutely. So, and yeah. and the way that you the, the way that you actually describe that initially and going to into the idea of seeing ourselves in mm -hmm. the environment and helping to kind of build esteem that way to realize I do fit, I belong. Mm -hmm. Seeing yourself as a leader in the environment is that I see people who are similar to me, who have identify the way that I do that are excelling and leading others. I think that those are very powerful aspects. And you're starting to see a little bit of that in industry, yeah. in professional life, in social lives even, within the autistic, autistic community. But give me some examples potentially of, you know, from your conversations and from what you've learned from the community is how how do autistics in general, what are they seeing about their support systems or where we're failing them in being able to create the opportunity to see their successes and see that they are a part of every community that they're involved in? Yeah, I think that, and again, going back to seeing yourself within society, I think that's changed a lot, especially for people with, with autism over the last 10 years. I mean, think about now how many uh, movies and television shows and stuff are out there that have characters with autism on them, right? Sesame Street has somebody with autism. You got the good doctor, love on the spectrum, on the spectrum, atypical, parenthood, the A word. I mean, you've got a whole list of these shows that are demonstrating autism, some more positive than others. Um, but again, you have novels, you have, um, I remember when the first, oh, what was it? The case of the, what was the mystery book? The dog and the, uh, I should have written this down. <laughs> anyway, there was a mystery book and it was a detective with an autism, with, with autism. Um, and it was like the first time that there'd been this uh, a protagonist, right? With autism. Um, and so I think over the past 10 years, we've started to see more representations of autism within society. And as we see that, I think people become more comfortable with it, right? And it, and it provides an opportunity for, again, people with autism to say, oh, that's a person like me. They are doing this, that, or the other, depending on what it is. I think the one I'll pick on, because I've just recently discovered is love on the spectrum, right? These are people who are having relationships and who are trying to navigate that sort of adult 
relationship world and it shows some of the challenges and the struggles that that these couples are are struggling with and that makes you feel like it's okay right if i Mm -hmm. struggle with this too because you see it um and so i think that's that's been really important um but i do think one of the dangers is and this is always the danger with media is that it does lead to more stereotypes among people without autism spectrum disorders about what it is and how people with autism behave. And again, we have this tendency to put people in boxes, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Oh, that's what autism is. It's this. And um, and so I do think, so on the one hand, I think there's more positive representations that have made inclusion and people being a little more comfortable talking about autism possible. Um, but I still think we need more alternative perspectives and you mentioned strengths based um sort of well looking at somebody through a strengths based lens um that is really i think important to truly becoming inclusive and enhancing belonging we have a tendency from very early on to look at what somebody's deficits are right i mean this is how we start even with early intervention <laughs> You know, you have IDEA Part C, early intervention. You're going to go in. This kid's not behaving the way that the kid's supposed to behave. And what do we do? We define that child by its deficits from, very, you know, from before it turns one, the child turns one in many cases. And that mm-hmm. kind of follows people through their lives. And, you know, one thing that we need to do is, I think, start thinking in more of a strengths-based direction. What are some of the things that people with autism or other disabilities can do? And again, I think we're seeing some of that, which is leading to uh, some of the current employment initiatives around employing people with autism spectrum disorders, right? Um, There are some unique skills and talents that somebody with autism has that really make them well-suited to certain employment environments and job types and things like that. And so I think that's a great example of, you know, industry looking at, okay, how can we take a more strengths-based approach and not look at this? The fact that somebody may have difficulty navigating a relationship is fine. We just are more creative about how we set up the work environment, right? And uh, absolutely. We, we they- play to their strengths. And that, again, playing to somebody's strengths makes somebody feel like, oh, I fit, I belong. Yep. I'm supposed to be here. They get me. And anytime we, we all want to feel understood. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, I'm, and I think that that's something that we all need to almost take a step back every once in a while and just think about ourselves. And this, yep. I think this is, this is almost everybody. And, and I'm not going to try and say that, that there aren't outliers, but when we have a chance to excel, when we have a chance to succeed, we feel more confident and we feel included. We feel a part of the environment we're in. And I I think that that is such an important aspect to whether it's early intervention, whether it's school, whether it's uh, employment and social relationships, it's finding those successes yep. and highlighting them. Um, but you hit on something that, uh, you know, and, and I'll, I'll say is that I, I sometimes find myself forgetting is that it's easier to normalize something when you are a part of that majority. Yeah. And when you feel like an outsider is that and you're not seeing what you're experiencing on a regular basis, it's got to be really tough to normalize it. And the idea that media and it has its flaws. But is creating what you what you talked about as far as some of those shows and some of those even documentaries where somebody's experiencing and even on social media, self-advocacy, that has got to help so much into normalizing what I'm feeling, what I'm going through and saying, you know what, there, there's a lot of good about me. Mm-hmm. And people need to stop seeing the things that I know that I'm working on. And and I'd hate it if everybody was always lambasting me for the things I wasn't succeeding at. But just it it's got to feel bad. And is that the experience that you're that you're seeing and hearing on a regular basis? Is we have to change the narrative? Yeah. No. Absolutely. I think we we all need to change the narrative. Again, we grow up in a deficit based culture. Um, where it's more about remediating deficits than it is actually about helping somebody feel like they they belong and fit in. But um, 
Yeah, so it is it is shifting the way that we think to that more positive strengths based approach. I think the autism self advocacy movement, or that's really grown over the past ten years, is a great example of this. Uh, people speaking up, saying, "This has been my experience. This is you know, this is what I went through. This is what I want now." And again, one of those things about inclusion and feeling like you belong is having those mentors and role models and people who are modeling those positive behaviors so that you can look at them and say, oh, they're doing that. It's okay for me to do that too. It's hard to take risks, but if you see somebody else taking those risks and speaking out and finding their voice and everything else, it makes it easier for those who come behind to do to do the same thing. And so, again, I think you're exactly right. It is about shifting that narrative and looking at the world in a little bit of a different way. I mean, I don't want to profess too much here, but one of the one of the things that drives me nuts, I've been in disability for my whole career. My, my doctorate's in special education. I worked in schools uh, here in Utah and Idaho. Um, and one of the things that has driven me nuts is just our irrational understanding of disability. We seem to see disability as something that happens to an abstract other. It's those mm -hmm. people. And and we have this weird like barrier <laughs> in our brain. And the one thing that disability it, that makes disability different from other markers of diversity is that disability is the one minority group that we're all going to join at some part point in our life. I can't go out and become African American. I can't go out and become Hispanic. That's not who I am. And no matter how hard I try, I'm not going to change that. But I can go out and get into an accident, get an illness, whatever the case may be, and end up with a significant lifelong disability or a temporary disability, whatever the case may be. And that's all of a sudden becomes me. And so uh, when we're talking about inclusion and disability and everything else, again, we have this way of thinking us versus them. But really, it's about all of us. A great example of this is a friend who I had in Boise uh, there. I won't I won't share names or anything else, but he was a, he's a lawyer <laughs> and he had an office in one of the old um, built the whole historic buildings in downtown there. And it, it, as a historic building, there were exemptions to ADA. And although he, there were people who were asking them to make ADA accommodations and make the office more accessible, they really fought to maintain the historic nature of the building. And, and, and really his excuse was, well, I don't have any clients with disabilities, so I don't need to make it accessible. I don't serve that population of people. And oddly enough, he was a he was a bike racer. He was out riding his bike in Meridian one day, um, was coming around a corner, got hit by a car, uh, ended up in a really terrible accident, ended up in it, about a year's worth of surgeries and hospitalizations. He ended up uh, paralyzed and using a wheelchair. And the odd thing was, once he'd gone through rehabilitation and everything else, he was ready to go back to work. Guess what? He couldn't get into his office. <laughs> Because he thought that this was something that happens to those people. Yeah. And yet it's not. It's something that happens to all of us. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we think about disability and whether it's autism, and yes, there are aspects of autism that, you know, are sort of genetic and inherent in somebody. I'm not going to go out. I don't have an autism. Uh, I don't have a diagnosis of autism. Um, but that doesn't mean that I won't write acquire another mental illness or mm -hmm. a, a cognitive impairment. I write a high fever of 106 for a couple of days and all of a sudden my brain's different. Um, yep. And so these are, anyway, there's, I just think the way that we approach disability in many cases is very irrational. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and the thinking of us versus them doesn't make any sense to me. When yeah. we think about disability, we need to be thinking, this is something that applies to all of us. And what I do to help somebody fit in and to feel like they belong may in the future help me as well. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're a self-advocate before you even realize that it is advocating for yourself. I mean, yep. it's, it's one of those interesting uh, kind of uh, situations where you can do more now to be able to help yourself feel more included 
in yep. that in that situation. The uh, it, it, one thing that you hit on is is irrationality, and to be honest, is that the and I'll I'll talk for the it, just kind of putting it in the autistic lens again is that there has been a lot of patience from the autistic community for yep. the irrationality of society to to catch yep. up a little bit. Yeah. Um, and the the persistence of, you know, let's try and form the voice. Let's make sure we are represented. Let's see and make sure that people understand what it what those strengths are and how to be able to make sure that we are active, engaged members of the community. It's it's hard and resilience is hard to continue to have. And this is where I kind of want to yeah. hear a little bit more about Dr. Laughter is that. <laughs> To be honest, I don't know that I could understand giving up and just saying, you know what, it is us versus them and forget it. Like, so how does how does laughter play a role in, in just kind of getting through those tough moments? OK, that's well. So let me go back and actually address a, an earlier question. I don't think I quite answered and tie that into laughter, if that makes sense. As we were talking about inclusion and belonging, um, one of the things that we've overlooked is the fact that inclusion has become about a place. Somebody's in a place. Belonging, though, and inclusion's hard to measure, right? Is somebody included or not included? The interesting thing is we can measure belonging. And the thing we've discovered about belonging is that belonging increases resilience. Belonging, people who feel like they have social support, people who feel like they belong tend to be happier, they tend to be healthier. They tend to live longer. And there's lots of research in aging and racial disparities and disability that show this over and over and over again. This is really caused by what's this is um uh, caused by what's called the social buffering hypothesis that being together helps us feel safer and more supported. This is why zebras run around in herds and fish go in schools because when you're in a group, right, you kind of you kind of blend in or hypothetically blend in, and that helps you feel safer from any external threats if we go to the biological sort of basis of it. But some of this research on belonging has become really, um, really interesting over the past 10 years in looking at um, how does fitting in really help increase resilience? And if we look at some of the studies that have been done on um minority college students, right? We see that students who come into college who are from a racial minority and go through a belonging treatment, and then you have a control group. What we find is the students that go through this belonging treatment, it actually increases their academic performance by 79% and their health outcomes are better than the control group. They have fewer illnesses and fewer trips to the doctor. Um, so you can actually measure the impact of feeling like you fit in. Um, belonging in workplaces, if we want to look at it from a more positive point of view, workplaces where everyone says, oh, I feel like I belong. I feel like people understand me. There's a 55% increase in performance, 50% reduction in employee turnover, 75% decrease in sick days. I mean, so we have really measurable impact factors of this belonging and how it affects us personally, it makes us healthier, happier. And so that belonging is a key element of cultivating resilience. Um, and one way to really enhance that belonging is through laughter. Now, a lot of times we think of laughter, especially here in the West, we think of laughter as something silly, right? And we're trained not to laugh, right? Serious people don't laugh. Um, you, you know, a serious person is walking around with a scowl on their face, stressed out and those are the important people. Um, <laughs> but but laughter is actually, the research on laughter shows that laughter is a natural stress management and it's a communication tool. So there's research on laughter in lots of animals, dogs, cats, rats, monkeys, dolphins, um, most herd animals. And what we find in animals is that laughter helps animals feel safe. I don't know how de how geeky you want me to get with this. <laughs> <laughs> laughter in animals is called chuffing. And so it doesn't sound like laughter in animals, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you. So I grew up in Alaska and I like to use the example of bears in Alaska. So bears are relatively solitary creatures. They have huge territories. They don't, they're not social really. They do come together when there's a large 
food source. Mm -hmm. And when bears come together, um, they communicate. Now, they don't talk, (laughs) but when a bear comes across another bear on a trail, there's really two things that they do. One is they try to intimidate the other bear and they do that by standing up, making themselves bigger, popping their jaws. They actually open their jaw and pop the hinge of their jaw, which makes this sort of threatening noise. Now, if a bear comes across another bear and they are relaxed and they want to say, okay, uh, it's okay, I'm not aggressive, they chuff. So, and that's, and so it's a forceful exhalation. (sighs) And people hear this and they're like, oh, they're going to fight. The bears are angry. Well, no, the bears are chuffing. And that chuffing, when one bear hears the chuffing, it's like, oh, this bear's not aggressive. And the other bear chuffs back. And the other bear hears that and says, oh, they're not aggressive. And they kind of pass. And everybody who's watching is disappointed there wasn't a giant bear fight. Um, <laughs> but, but herd animals do this too. Um, if you, I don't know, well, you're up there in Idaho. There's a lot of hunters and stuff. I used to go hunt when I lived in Moscow. Uh, if you're going out to hunt elk or deer or something in a herd, you'll you'll notice that they'll all be grazing, but there's usually one animal that's watching for danger, right? Mm-hmm. And you break a branch or you make a movement and that watch animal makes a high pitch sound and the whole herd lifts up their head and is on alert, right? Paying attention. They're in that fight or flight response. They're kind of ready to respond. Now, if that watch animal doesn't see anything to alarm it further, that watch animal chuffs. It's a, again, a forceful exhalation. Uh, And the herd will go back to relaxing and doing what it did. Now, that is the same thing that happens in humans when we hear laughter. When we laugh, we relax, but actually when we hear people laugh, it actually relaxes us. And when we relax, it actually turns off that fight or flight response, that stress response that makes us right anxious and right, do I need to protect myself? Do I need to be careful? Do I need to, that laughter relaxes us and it allows us to say, oh, I fit in here. These Mm -hmm. people get me, I belong. Actually, laughter is one of the few things that actually releases oxytocin. And I don't know, oxytocin is called the trust hormone. And so it's the hormone, it's released very few times in a person's life naturally. It's released when you have sex, it's released uh, when a mother's nursing her child, and it's the hormone that actually creates the mother-child bond. Um, okay. But it's also rela- It's also released when we laugh. And that's why somebody who you've genuinely laughed with, you feel like you have a deeper connection with them. Because you've actually released that oxytocin, which has created a chemical bond between you and that person. You implicitly trust that person because of that natural effect of laughter and that oxytocin mm-hmm. that was released. And so, anyway, there's we could get all geeky and weird with laughter, and you can tell I get really animated about this because I'm I love it. <laughs> but it but it does sound like is that I mean one of the the most important things for to, for building community, building relationship, building trust is occasionally putting your guard down, yeah. which is appreciating one another to the level where you can share an experience like laughter and share yep. that opportunity, which I think sometimes if if you're constantly evaluating yourself against somebody else, is that you're on guard. You're always sitting there trying to know what can I do, what I can't I do, or how do I perform here versus just being, which I think is the ultimate of belonging, right? Yep. Is that if you could be yourself yep. in a situation and feel successful, is that you could ultimately share that experience of laughter and belong. Yep. I think it's kind of cool the way that the way that you illustrated that. Um, I do want, I do have one additional kind of thought question. And and maybe you have insight to this. My inclination would be is that even in that first description you gave of a school mm-hmm. setting where somebody just is put in a position where they're not going to be successful yeah. because you didn't provide any means for them to be able to demonstrate their talents, to be right. a contributor, right. is that there's got to be a healthy balance between empowering somebody and providing the right supports and providing all those resources 
so that they can be themselves in the environment and be successful. Is that something that as a community that that sometimes we're still overlooking? Are we still not resourcing things the appropriate way across all the environments? Yeah, no, you're exactly right. Um, and I think that term that you bring up, community, is really, really important. Um, we need community. We need to feel like we're connected. We need to feel like people see us. We all want to be seen and acknowledged for who we are. Um, and I think frequently, especially here in the United States, we've become so focused on efficiency and just getting to the task and just getting stuff done um, that we overlook the importance of building that community and creating situations where people can share who they are and people can become comfortable and learn about that. I mean, I think about the first day of class at the university, right? Well, even when I taught in high school, um, you go in, you hand out the syllabus, you say, okay, this is what you're going to do. And you just start jumping in to right doing the lessons and there's no time, you know, you're going to spend an entire semester, maybe even a whole year with these people taking a week maybe even two weeks to build some community to help people meet one another to really create situations where people have a chance to share what they're bringing to the setting um really makes a huge difference in the tone and actually when you do again these are like these are called belonging interventions um and that's a whole other topic but things that you do to create community and create belonging actually shows that um, in the long run, you get more accomplished. It's higher quality. It's it, it's more. It's just more effective. It's a more effective setting. People are yeah. just when people feel safe, and people feel supported, um, they just perform better. And no. so yes, it has to be intentional. And and that I mean that's the the intent to it. I think is the part that I feel like. Oftentimes, people don't know where to go. They don't know how to build those skills. They don't know how to be able to access. I mean, I look at my daughter. Is that she? She had the empathy. She wants to do the right thing, which as a, as a father, you're proud of. Right. But yeah. developing those skills to be able to act on that, or for others in the community that are saying, you know what, I want to be able to create belonging. I want to be able to create inclusion, which by term you've already defined is that sense of community and belonging is so where do people turn how do how do they get the same understanding that that you've been able to kind of share with us where where can people start to get that information so they can start to build the right communities around them <laughs> that's a that's a big question <laughs> Um, there's a lot of different models out there. There's a, a particular model that we've worked with here in Utah is the asset-based community development. I don't know, ABCD, I don't know if you've heard of that model. Um, but there's, there's lots of different community building models that are coming out of different social justice uh, type movements. Um, and so there's, there's, and I don't have actually a list here of resources. I should have had that in front of me. Um, but I can send you some resources yeah. there are and some great do, we'll community building sure. resources yeah and belonging resources um and i could send you those i mean but really what it takes i think it, it's very core is going back to what you said earlier is it needs to be it needs to be intentional we need to again break the patterns that we're stuck in that we're just going to get to business and we need to create time i think your daughter's a great example again um if the teacher knew that your daughter was having those thoughts and, and if your daughter felt comfortable expressing that to the teacher, then the teacher could say, okay, what can I do to help address and really magnify, right? Your daughter's desire, her empathy to help another person and really engaging the class and problem solving, right? How do we help the student or students feel like they're more or include them more in what we do. I mean, but again, we, your daughter probably didn't say anything to the teacher. It came home and told you and chances are the teachers are overworked, underpaid. I mean, all those things are not, it's, it's hard to be a teacher these days. So I'm just going to acknowledge that. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I think it requires us to think in a different way. 
about how we how we set up our environments and we take we take time to cultivate what are now called soft skills right those emotional intelligence type things that are so important to helping us feel safe and accepted so that we can perform at our best no and and i I mean i think that that they're called soft skills but they're skills that enable us like you said to be able to do almost anything in in the world around us and and without those skills is that we are are we lose our power we lose our abilities we lose our chance to be influencers um yep. and i think it's important um so uh, dr wapit i i definitely appreciate you coming on and sharing your experiences but i i do want others to be able to access some of the material that you've been able to put out there as a, as in in the field of academia and in some of the presentations that you're doing, um, where can people find that information about you and about what you've been working on? So there's several places. I I have a website, so matthewoppet.com, my name. Um, then you can go to the Institute for Disability Research Policy and Practice, so idrpp.usu.edu here, and there's a lot of resources on there. Uh, I'm also on social media. I think I sent over all those handles and if you want to do more laughter and stuff, I've started putting stuff up on. I know I took the I took the leap, Jeff, and I got onto TikTok with my kids, ah. <laughs> my kids encouragement. And I'm trying to do laughter stuff on TikTok. So if you want to see laughter and understand more about the science of laughter, there's stuff there. Um, but LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, it's all my name. I'm the only Matthew Wapit in the world, I think. So <laughs> <laughs> well, Not we hard appreciate to find. it. And I know that, uh, I mean, it's it's a lot of information and there's just, I mean, people have to take baby steps. And like you said, the resilience and persistence to this is so important. But even if we can make things better a little bit at a time is that that's, that's kind of the goal is that is that we all continue to improve and accessing a lot of the resources, I think is the way to do it is education is power. So thanks so much, Dr. Wapa. We appreciate you coming on. Yeah, you bet. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for listening to Autism Weekly. We hope you tune back in next week to learn more about autism in the real world. Autism Weekly is now found on all the major listening apps, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, and more. Subscribe to be notified when we post a new podcast. Autism Weekly is produced by ABS Kids. ABS Kids is proud to provide diagnostic assessments and ABA therapy to children with developmental delays like autism spectrum disorder. You can learn more about ABS Kids and the Autism Weekly Podcast by visiting abskids.com. Thanks for tuning in. See you again next week.